Hello, uh, good afternoon, and welcome to Daybreak News with the Guyanese Critic. Today, once again, I'm having an interview with the Vice President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, uh, Dr. Barrett Jaglio, as it relates to pertinent issues affecting Guyanese, um, mainly COVID-19, um, oil and gas, and the PNC. Uh, getting right into it, Vice President, thank you once again for having me. Um, Guyana, like all the other countries in the world, is having an uphill battle with COVID-19. Um, whether it is as a direct result of propaganda propagated by the opposition or persons aligned with the opposition, or as a matter of fact, um, it seems that we're not dealing well with COVID-19 in Guyana. Um, people are not adhering to the rules. The president has had to make a number of pleas. What uh, approach is this administration taking or planning to take to ensure that the numbers do not keep surging uh, forward? So, well, as you pointed out, this is a very difficult um, situation to manage globally. That countries across the world have seen an upsurge in the rates of infection and it cuts across all sorts of countries with different policies countries that have gone into full lockdown mode have seen an upsurge and countries that have been more balanced and open have also seen some form of upsurge. So many people who are calling for a shutdown, a total shutdown, given the global experience, it doesn't mean that you'll be able to, to control the upsurge if you shut down the society totally. And then there are the other attendant problems to doing so that is depriving people of an opportunity to work, conduct business, etc. So we have had uh, an approach from the very beginning that we will do ensure that our society remains open, but we will take some measures to ensure that we keep our infection rate stable. For a very long time we have succeeded. We have been built the capacity to do more testing, enormously so, moving from about 50 tests per day to uh, as much as 1,400 deaths per day now. So at least you know who, you know, who is infected. And with higher rates of te testing, you're going to have more people identified with the problem, with, with the COVID infection. Because if you're testing 50 persons a day and 85 had COVID, you, it meant that you would not have known about 35 others. That is assuming you tested only people who had the COVID. So we knew that once you're doing more testing, you will have higher numbers showing. Two, we built an, a great capacity in the hospital at great cost to address um, the more serious cases, particularly in the ICU department. We've made uh, significant investment in building their capacity to deal with an upsurge. Um, we have seen the numbers around um, between nine to about 14 persons in ICU um, throughout this period. But we built a capability that is even higher than that. That should, because some countries, you never know what will happen that you may see uh, an even greater upsurge. And then we have decided to roll out the vaccines aggressively. Now, the biggest problem is not the money we will spend whatever it takes to protect our people, all of our people. We want 100% of our adult population vaccinated. 
the big issue has been the procurement of the vaccine. We have had a hard time doing so. We got the initial set that came in um, that was shared through Barbados, about 3,000 from uh, Mia Motley, as the AstraZeneca vaccine. Then we got 80,000 from, um, from India, um, and that, that is just 40,000 because it's two, two doses. We, we got 20,000 Sinopharm va vaccines, and we have purchased 200,000 uh, from Sputnik, the Sputnik Russian vaccine, but we've had a huge problem with delivery schedule. The, to get the vaccine here, the, many of the airlines don't want to take the risk because with the Sputnik vaccine, you have to keep it constantly at minus 20. You know, um, so it has to be at that rate. So we've had a hard time every night struggling. We now have 55,000, hopefully another 83,000 um, will come in by Monday. And so we're hoping that we can have 200,000 full doses of the, the um, Sputnik vaccine. That will take us to about 206 to 1,000 persons fully vaccinated when that's completed. And we are looking to procure more because we are aiming for an adult population of 500,000. So right now we're busy seeking out vaccine and we and vaccines that are that have some level of efficacy. A lot of people who talk glibly say why can't you get the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine? The, the big countries are locking down all of the vaccine for themselves. I know it has been a struggle, but we will get there and we will, that's the ultimate protection. Now, there have been a lot of misrepresentations of the vaccine, etc. And I want people to know that even with the vaccines, you can actually get COVID. Um, some vaccines are more efficacious against preventing COVID than others, but you can get it. But the thing that with all the vaccines, Sinopharm, with AstraZeneca, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, and, and um, the Pfizer vaccine, they all of anyone who was taking the vaccine and had enough of a period to develop the immunity a, a few weeks, none of those people have been hospitalized and died because of COVID. So the illness is not so severe. So even though you may catch it from, still, that it doesn't result in hospitalization and death. And that is why people say any vaccine you can get, that's the scientists, just take it, whichever one you can get because they prevent death among people. At least this is what the science, science is showing. We have had another issue where some people have had skepticism about taking the vaccine and they're telling people, oh, you'll get impotent or some problem with the vaccine and it's some conspiracy. There's none of that. And our people have to be responsible and take the vaccine because we're putting others at risk, too. not only themselves, but their, their families. So I'm hoping we are now, even today, we had a decision to make to open it up to people of every age. Although we have limited numbers, because we find that a lot of young people are going out too, and maybe often they are the carriers, you know, taking it back home into the families. They're, they're not observing social distancing or washing or wearing the mask, and therefore they're ca carrying this home. So we will safeguard a number, maybe 10, 15,000 for older folks and people with comorbidities and then open it up to anyone about 80. So I think by t today, from starting today or tomorrow, or sometime as soon, soon as the ministry announces it, because they were given instructions today, to open it up for anyone about 18 years old. And we're hoping that to be able to buy enough vaccine to, to vaccinate everyone. So that has been done. We, we shifted, we opened up the country, but we still, um, 
we we have a curfew. Some people are calling for the curfew to be brought back to the 6 p.m. But there's been no direct link that people are getting infected in the curfew hours. That during the normal course of the daily activities, because a lot of people are not wearing masks or protecting themselves, they get, that's when the infection is going on. And, and then we saw surges. So we had a surge in April, um, March, and we believe that the surge took place because around Mashramani, most of our people are out. And if the surge took place mainly in Region 4. So we're expecting maybe another surge based on, on Pagua. We had Pagua and we had Easter. You know, people gather up in large numbers, larger numbers, although we try to prevent that from happening. So you can, three, four weeks later, you see the surge because that's when the infection rates take hold. So we're, we're trying to keep managing all of these affairs, but nothing can, for, you can't force citizens, except we lock them up, and we don't want to do that. To be responsible, people have to understand we're in the middle of a pandemic. They have to protect their families and themselves too. A lot are not acting responsibly, until now. And I don't think our society is ready for the heavy-handed measures that some are instituted in parts of the world. Because how many people are you gonna lock up? How many people are you gonna lock up? You have to focus on those who are, where there are egregious breaches. You know, and I agree with some of the places that open beyond curfew hours, unreasonably so. But, but you can't do that. So it's all a struggle. It's a struggle, but this is a national struggle. Um, we have to involve as many people as possible. I saw the citizen initiative call for some things and, and I, I agree with, with everyone being involved in this, this area. And I urge people, as soon as there's a possibility to get the vaccine, Go, go and take, take the vaccine. Um, Vice President Jadu, your uh, the administration that you're part of seems very, um, from my perspective and from the complaints I've been receiving, very lackadaisical in dealing with the opposition and what is seen as mischief. They whisper campaigns that are um, perpetuated by the opposition and people affiliated with them um, as it relates to people impotence with the vaccine and this is very important across the world there are a lot of discussions on that because it's very important to save lives to get vaccinated now the opposition plays an active role in that um, they recently there has been an attempt to suggest there were a number of kidnappings um, one person was in charge for uh, misleading the, the nation, right? Um, all of this, the opposition plays a role, sometimes uh, behind the scenes and sometimes publicly. Um, recently, uh, PNC executive member Aubrey Norton uh, made claims that Guyana voted down a uh, UN resolution to, to deal with racism. Um, no evidence and malicious attitude and your administration seems to be very lackadaisical in in dealing with these issues is that it is a bit of an oversight or just an unwillingness to rec recognize the kind of injury and damage that could be brought to Guyanese and, and Guyana as a result of reckless behavior by the opposition um could it it's the DPI is to um the new news is not very attractive to DPI. It is, you know, often about somebody cutting a ribbon here or a project being open, etc. Well, now, why, why this is important for national development and growth and shows progress, it doesn't have the same sort of attraction. And as 
some of these wild people making these outlandish statements and I don't think the state medium or media can replicate that sort of behavior come up with a series of unsubstantiated rumors etc even when they try to rebut it the rebuttal is done once and also this is a lie and they move on the state media moves on or we move on because you have other things to do they are at this for an objective and they're incessant and they have and that is designed in a way that it becomes almost over overwhelming and then the pieces fit together for example how do the narratives different sorts of narrative that seem disparate how do they hang together in a consistent whole with apnu using it as a political strategy this is the way it does it's the central linchpin for all of this is racism and i suspect this will go on and we will return to this sort of conversation 100 times in every interview we have we have or in in national life for the next several years because apnu as we have recognized has nothing else to talk about no other political strategy than racism they have had no track record of achievement they have left the track record as one of the most corrupt governments ever seen in this hemisphere they are bereft of vision they are in a confused state within their own party that is the PNC they have lost the respect of citizens across the country they have no momentum and they are hoping to build momentum around racism again because recognizing it's an emotive issue and they hope that the racism because it appeals to emotion will dampen the massive development that's taking place under the BBP so that even an afro ghanese community that will benefit significantly or an individual would say hold on a minute but still they are racist that's what they are hoping to to instill in people and so this is why every day if you look at any program it could be sherrod duncan the rickford bork harman norton and any time they appear back whatever they call it the central theme is racism so the kidnapping is just a variant of the racism because all oh, people are kidnapped in guyana again they're being disappeared ppp is disappearing young black youths because this is a racist ppp government that is how it comes together it starts off in a benign way oh somebody has been kidnapped but eventually it ends up to support the same narrative of racism that they are pursuing it's totally inventive inventive the people the few followers who they are there hardcore followers many of whom were corrupt and beneficiaries of the largest when they were there replicate this news over and over that's their talking point and so that this rumor the fiction becomes fact in in the minds of many people and they don't stop to check whether it's true and so now Guyana suddenly is that young black Guyanese being kidnapped absolutely false but but that took over social media for a very long time and it's dominated their circles the point about the UN resolution is another one that you had a situation where Guyana co-sponsored this resolution against racism we are one of the sponsors of the resolution how could we vote 
against the resolution if we are sponsoring it. As chair of the G77, we co-sponsor this to fight against racism. So, we, this is absolutely false again. We did not. They had some issue in the office over there where somebody, one of the staff of Foreign Affairs may have, may have pressed the wrong buzzer from the same floor. They stood up the same day and said, we voted wrongly there, something of that nature. A confusion there that took place. The, the no, APNU knows that. Even their statement acknowledged that there was a request from the floor. They change it. But we are co-sponsor of the resolution. So that is suddenly has become, oh, the PPP voted against a resolution on racism. The, PPP, the, the government co-sponsored on in last year that resolution against racism. The PPP government that is co-sponsored it. So that's the that's second issue. I've seen Rick Ferd work and all of these now. They, they, he is hoping every day they write the congressmen in the U.S. government to talk about racism. But these are the biggest racists in the world. They see nothing else about race and people's color, the color of their skin or everything else. Harmon, etc. Uh, Harmon goes to talk about oh why he that President Ali was not invited to Biden's conference on the environment and that is seen as a diminution of Guyana. You know why we were not invited? Because in 2015 we had one of the highest profile globally on the environment for a small country. By the time APNU left office we had gone in the ditch. Nobody knew anything about us. We lost all global momentum. We, we were busy running around with a green, just green state um, paper or something of that sort, planting a couple of green trees here, a couple of trees. Harmon was the, the focal point for many of the global environmental organizations when he was there in the office of the president. The guy is clueless about basic things. We lost momentum, we lost funding, etc. Because they didn't know what to do. We, have, in the short period we've been there, we've started to rebuild that momentum and a global presence. And, and once again, we're starting to get known as a country that has made an impact globally on the environment. In, um, in the circles. They should, he should be ashamed to even mention something like that. We were the largest per capita forest carbon trading scheme in the world. We did it when there was no market for forest carbon. Since we got into office, we have now tried, to, we have re-engaged re in our region. We have even applied for retroactive financing under the ART, the architecture for Red Plus transactions. We're working heavily on a, we've redefined the spending on the Global Climate Fund and many other areas. They have multiple projects with tons of consultants, tiny projects all over the place. I've been cleaning up that place to see that we have a coherent national strategy on the environment once again. And he talks about, Harman talks about, about um, environment. So, and so, I, I strayed a bit there because I was talking about the central issue, about racism. That will be the only thing that they can talk about. You have ask anyone, a Rick Ford Burke or a Sheryl Duncan, whether he could talk about anything dealing with policy, policies, even on the oil and gas sector, nothing. Nothing of the sort. It's always boils down back to racism. Vice President, again, the word, the term I use is lackadaisicalness just now. But is there an unwillingness? Is the PPP we are administration... We are, we are lackadaisical. 
because we are so caught up with working every day from morning to night on developing this country that often it's painstaking to have to go on the air every day and deal with lies and rumors. It's not, in my head, it's not productive. I don't want to spend my time on responding to a Bork or a Harmon every single day of my life. I have to look out for, to see cheaper power for people. And our kids can have, a, you know, maybe better schooling or they're, that we're taking care of COVID or hospitals grow and we're fixing you know, the environment or generating jobs for our people. That is where our energy gets dissipated. And, but this is not for the PPP alone or the government. All, everyone who loves this country would have to make a decision whether we want to go down this barren route of allowing ourselves to be misled by a few useless people who have made no contribution to our country, or we want to get involved and move forward in a productive way. And so every person who supports the PPP or even those who don't support the PPP, decent-minded people, including Afno people, they should take on this because it's a, it's a barren position. How does the, is the PPP administration going to be forging forward? Um, I know you extended an olive branch to supporters of the opposition and the president continually says he is a president for all oh, Um Can you say what is the PPP's position now? Um, since only recently, members of, uh, members of the opposition and, and, and um, supporters of the opposition even reached out to me and were saying that they don't want to see a Harmon or a Granger in the next Congress. Um, where does that leave the PNC and the PPP now? Will you ex be extending again olive branches to the supporters to say we are here for you when you need us? Yes, and, and that's constant. And you know, the biggest, I dealt with this, I don't know if it's on your program, but, but a point I was making is that they're doing, by harping constantly on racism, they're doing a huge disservice to people who support them. Because I can imagine a young afro Ghanaian kid trying to secure help from the government, a scholarship from the government. But constantly hearing, this racist government would not help you or has a plan to, of genocide. Immediately the mindset of that young kid would not be to seek help from the government. When the government wants to accord help to all of our people, all of our, our children, young people, etc. They're creating a mindset where people would just be reluctant to even want to seek out benefits that the state should accord to all of its citizens because they have a, a, a predisposed position because they hear Harmon or Sheriff Duncan say, oh, they're racist. They wouldn't want to help you to seek out those opportunities. They're harming afro Guyanese immeasurably by doing that. We want every Guyanese to be aggressively seeking out opportunities created by the government, regardless of whether they support us or not, regardless of which race or religion they belong to. That's the function of the government, to provide opportunities for its people. Not everyone can get all the opportunities because they are limited, but not to have a mindset like that. And that's what they're, they're doing. And then this becomes self-fulfilling, you know? You don't seek out help, then you think it's, you can't seek help because it, you never get help. And so that is a crucial issue for me, the damage that is, is being done. So we will always be there for our new supporters too, as Guyanese. And they don't have to go through a Harman or any Apnu to seek help from the government. 
it's our job to to get all of our people educated and staying healthy and in jobs etc that's how i see it i don't know how the pnc congress will pan out i see they have a lot of controversy but it's very hard to discuss seriously with leaders who may not even have the support of their own people you know and that is very hard to do and you know because they may not be there for a short while or they may just be squatting on positions within their own party dr jagio you more than any other person has an understanding of the effects of the methods uh fear mongering um, race inciting that the PNC <laughs> yes, uses, yes. being president, being opposition leader, yeah. now vice president. Um, when you were opposition leader, you saw the need to deploy methods to assist you in assuring the world understands what the government was doing at the time and their attitude and who they were, um, mainly using uh, mercury. Um, can you say in light of the fact you have accepted that you are now in a position of hyperdrive trying to fulfill the needs of the citizens, would this government or can this government deploy any other methods that will ensure that the international community and the world sees what opposition, who was recently a government, what they are doing to cause segregation and damage to Guyana? Yes. I think it's crucial, so far from Washington, and we will continue to have lobbying efforts in Washington, not just for the, that, that issue, but also generally the, to ensure that our policy positions in other areas are understood clear, and clearly um, defined in those, those circles. So we will, we will, um, but there is a need to, in a sustained way, grief the international community and others in the face of this whisper campaign and the lies. I've seen how far the whisper campaign and the lies can go in perpetrating, you know, falsehoods. So I agree with you, we have to do more of that. But like with the PR, we're not really good at, at public relations. We really, the PVP has delivered a lot and we, we work very hard to get it delivered, but I think in PR in it, and in this world, if you don't see what you're doing, often people assume the worst. And so we definitely have to build a presence in the foreign ministry and, in, and using other methods to keep the world informed about what's going on with, in the local politics too and how negative it is and about these attempts to create fissures, fractures in our society. Vice President, we've, we've covered uh, I think, COVID. I think they got that same the alarm going. Mr. President, um, we have covered COVID and we've covered uh, the PNC and I think we've given them a little too much in light of the fact there's so much that the government is doing um, for Guyanese and I, I, I think media needs to play, media in general needs to play a greater role in highlighting what can be like their 20,000 um, scholarships mm -hmm. and people should be going after that. Um, oil and gas. Recently Exxon Mobil has wind down its production. Um, how does that affect Guyana, its development, and how do we, um, what methods are being deployed by this administration to ensure that Exxon Mobil sticks uh, to what agreements it has with our government in terms of delivery? It's um, the, an ambulance? Yeah, Woodlands. No, no. Huh? But is the ambulance? No, what oh. is the Okay, the alarm went off here. Yeah. Okay, I, it's not affecting your program. No, no, no. Okay, all right. There is this is hot. Right. People, there's like everything going off there. Like the oh. numbers gone oh, off. The like, numbers, oh. okay, yeah, all right. Yeah. I just wondered yeah. if it's affecting the program. So, um, 
So we are we're very concerned about the ongoing problem with the compressor and the issue with flaring. So right now the situation is where production has been scaled back and when production is affected output is affected it affects income and revenue to the government and therefore we have a great interest in ensuring that this is resolved swiftly and that there are appropriate penalties to those involved because it's not just loss to the shareholders but it's loss of revenue to the state of Guyana. So a letter by now would have been dispatched. No, that's okay. A letter would have been dispatched to Exxon Mobil because we need, they've been very reluctant to give the shareholders agreement with the operator. We have had issues with them when we were negotiating the Payara agreement with sharing with us the unitization agreement that would have been signed. We had issues, eventually it was. And so the ministry would have dispatched a letter already or it's on the way to get a copy of the shareholders agreement with the operator, which is Exxon. And because you know there are three shareholders that make up the company and Exxon is one of the shareholders but it is it has an operator's contract it operates the contract uh, or the, the FPSO and we want to see what liabilities accrue to the operator for non-performance uh, if, if any and how those are being implemented secondly we have requested or we are requesting in this this message from the ministry to Exxon we want to see an agreement between the company and the supplier of the vessel and we want to see what liabilities are in the contract for the non-performance or faulty performance and whether those have been triggered because if, if there are issues of non-performance, then they are that uh, result in a loss of revenue and income to the state of Ghana and to the shareholders, then the, the, the appropriate penalty must be, be, be introduced those individuals. So that is the position that we, we have taken. I met with the Ministry of um, natural resources and we are now yesterday we issued a statement that we're examining all of our options and uh, today that letter would have been discharged or must be on its way can you say to the Guyanese people where is this administration with local content local content so we are We've had a long history to this. I don't want to give you the, the whole background because from the manifesto, from us having this, the com president established a committee with, with Carl Greenwich, Floyd Haynes, Carvel Duncan, Sham Nocta, Kevin Ram, um, Ram, Ram Narain, and the, the Dr. Paul, um, and they produced a report that report was then narrowed down by the ministry. We then went to a, a one-day meeting at the convention center with the stakeholders that the president spoke at. Since then, they have been meeting with the stakeholders even further. Um, we, we plan to, once that final draft is ready, to send it back to the stakeholders, stakeholders for final comments and then institute the policy in place when you say stakeholders vice president who this are is the, in the industry as well as exxon mobile and the oil operators as well as the local guyanese community 
it will be posted back up on the website. It, we have it on the website. People can go and give our comments there. That's the initial draft. Once the final draft is done, we'll repost it. Guyanese can give their comments. But let me give you an idea because where we are looking for, what we are looking for. So we've made it clear we'd like to see, and we put, we put in the contract, that 100% of the rentals, rentals would be coming from Guyanese. We made it clear if our people cannot cannot build the FPSO because it's technically you know out of their range, we can build houses to rent, and that's very lucrative. So that will be a carve out in the local content policy on for for land for 100 percent services secondly things like brokerage service the exxon mobile and the others have been farming this out to foreign companies now our people can produce brokerage and custom services for for um, for the company but yet they have this proclivity to give it to companies from abroad and obscenely so obscenely so landscaping service when they had the headquarters going you had to have local companies compete against foreign companies for landscaping services those would have to be 100 percent Ghani. cleaning services um, domestic services a whole range of of services, food supplies, all of these things. I believe that 100% of those services should come from, from Guyanese or Guyanese companies and our Guyanese majority owned companies. And then, then there'd be other areas where, where you cannot do 100% because we don't have the capability where a percentage of the services will have to be procured from Guyana. So insurance sector, the banking sector, like some fabrication, all of these issues. So we want to make sure that we move rapidly. Trinidad and Tobago put this in, from what I gather, in 2004, after they had produced oil for 100 years. We don't want to wait, you know, so so long we want to do it immediately so our our people can grow with the industry and that is where we're aiming we're taking more time a little bit time because we want to get this done correctly and we want to make sure that the companies also um, that we're not putting on due burden on the companies so so that is where we are we are moving but sector by sector looking at what we can supply all of these things in the areas I mentioned we have enough capacity to supply the oil and gas industry and there are some other areas that I didn't mention as yet so we are working heavily on that there are some areas uh, understood that there are some areas that we do not have the capacity will the local content policy take into consideration that when that capacity or ability to acquire the capacity is reached, that Guyanese companies yeah, can now it, so it forge their way evolve. in. It will evolve. This is not a legislation that would be static. It's like you would have to review it. And as we build capacity, so too would the percentages increase in some sectors, as well as new sectors emerge onto that list that we can supply so this is not a one-off thing secondly we'll have to and have people to enforce the contract and i saw dr paul was right too in a recent newspaper article where he said you have to look at the local content by value not not volume so they could easily say Oh, we have 20 persons who are supplying, 20 Guyanese who are make it, giving us food supplies now. And why, when you check the 20, they're only supplying two, 
two baskets of bora or mangoes and the bulk of it is coming from one big supplier from abroad so if you measure by volume oh it would say 20 Guyanese versus one foreigner supplying food but when you look by value you would see that they're earning a pittance now all of these things would we have to ensure that we take account of and to have a mechanism to enforce this and to measure what the oil companies are not doing not to leave it just at their word we are making it very very clear that that is our intention this is one way remember we said that they would be counterproductive at this stage to renegotiate the contract but Guyanese must benefit this is our way second way is the gas uh, that the free gas to the project for the for the development of electricity will this administration be doing any personal capacity building as it relates to Guyanese will they be doing um, infusing education in the education sector and different sector to empower Guyanese to be able to fill well, um, positions in Ireland. Well, that's So, creating opportunities would be one layer through legislation. But training, we have made it clear that Guyanese have to be trained. We spoke with ExxonMobil about the need for training facilities here. Up to yesterday, there was a meeting held by the president and them about that. But on our own, of the scholarships, we have 4,500 scholarships this year. We will take resources to pay for the certification of Guyanese, to pay for the certification of Guyanese in, um, in many areas, so that they could easily be trained to conduct or to bring the people in to conduct classes where they improve the skills of Guyanese, but in a very practical way to, to deal with the industry. And then, of course, there will be the indigenization plan too, that we hope that a lot of the jobs that are being created by the oil companies now, where they have to recruit foreigners, that over time, once Guyanese have the comparable skills, that they too, they will, they will replace those individuals. Vice President, um, I think we've gone into uh, lengths as it relates to issues that are affecting Guyanese, uh, the more pertinent ones. Is there anything that you would like to leave with the citizens of this country as we close? Yeah, so, so um, on the same oil and gas sector, I've seen a lot of public comments, especially from the Kaichor News, um, about projects and especially the latest one has been about the gas to energy project and um, a lot of the statements are very misleading and not based on any reality fact or fact and so I we have had to this happened before you know many times if you go back in the past and you read the culture news you will would have thought that the Amila Falls was the worst project in the world Norway did an independent review after Apnu was in office and said we should go ahead with the Amila Falls they carried that how in the Mile Fall, two billion dollars worth of debt will come to the government of Ghana. The fact was, it's zero debt, not a cent of debt in the Mile Fall. They said the cost of electricity would have gone up. In fact, the fact was that at that time we were generating power at the price of oil at 20 cents per kilowatt hour the price of oil in that time. The, the project would have delivered power at 
10 cents per kilowatt hour, half of what we were paying. We would have saved a hundred odd million dollar, US dollars from the project annually. And that we were not owning the project, we were just buying power. So there was no risk to us. The, the Marriott Hotel, in spite of the fact that we did several feasibility studies, Mr. Christopher Ram and, and Glenn Lal said there was no feasibility study. The Marriott project was, they had over 60 articles in the Kaicho News saying how the Marriott project was a corrupt project and it was bad for the country. It was bad for the country. Today, and the Jack, they own part of the Marriott. The same culture. Today, they found out, actually it's not true. The government of Ghana owns the Marriott. And this is one of the most profitable Marriott's in this hemisphere, anywhere in the world, even through the pandemic. And without the Marriott there, I don't know what would have happened. The same thing with the Hope Canal. I can go through the Barbies Bridge would have never been built if we had listened. <clears throat> and so now they've just shifted the attention to the gas to electricity project. And so some people are saying, you see Ms. Ma Janky saying, um, oh, we didn't compare it with solar power. Now the first thing to understand and that solar power is renewable energy. Yes, solar power is renewable energy. But recently in Texas, they had solar power. They had moved aggressively to solar power. And they had winter and they had cloud cover for several days. And what happened? In the middle of a, a freezing cold, they had a snowstorm. They lost power. Here too in Guyana, if you have solar, first of all, it's cheaper without batteries, so if you tie it into the grid. If you have to build battery storage capacity, it becomes expensive. But even with the battery storage, if we have four days, three, two, two, in fact, two full days of overcast, rainy, you run out of power. That is why you still have to build the fossil fuel capability. Now, you, to run base load, countries need to have secure power all the time. You can't work based on how, when the wind blowing or when the sun shining. You also have to build a capability to ensure that you can keep the power on at all time, day or night. That's one consideration. The second consideration is that we are at the price of crude oil at $75 per barrel. It used to be a hundred and something dollars, $120 a barrel in the, in the, when I was president. It's now $75 a barrel. The cost of generating power is 14 US cents per kilowatt hour. We're selling power at about 30 US cents per kilowatt hour, just under that. 14 cents per kilowatt hour, US cents. <clears throat> now, with the pipeline coming in, they, they put a notional figure between 800 to 900 million for the pipeline. But we believe when we go to 10, to a tender, the price will come down significantly. But you have to build the, the project on the outer limits, the outer numbers. But when you go to tender, we believe it will drop by a couple of hundred million dollars. So even with that high capital figure, the pipeline the, and with building the power plant and amortizing the power plant for the pipeline, the, the power plant, which might cost about $450 million. When the two combine, when you amortize them and pay back for them, and you add the operation and maintenance costs, power will be generated or come into us at just over six cents per kilowatt hour. When we pay back for the pipeline, which will be short period, 
it will drop to five below five cents per kilowatt hour. Now compare that with 14 cents per kilowatt hour. It doesn't seem a lot. You know what the savings will be? Nearly 158, 160 million dollars a year. US dollars a year. 160 million. Just, you, just changing those. We work the numbers. That's why I said it's a no-brainer. If it's a no-brainer because anybody knows if you're if you're generating at 14, if you um, critic is generating for at 14 cents per kilowatt hour, and you can buy it for six cents per kilowatt hour, then it it makes sense to do that. You're saving a lot of money. It's a no-brainer. Christopher Ram said, I said people didn't have brain. But anybody who who looks at this judge profoundly, but it's this same sort of griping. They, a bunch of gripers. They have not done a single work on the financial feasibility of it as yet. You know. But they know what their numbers are. It's not good. We've gone through the project numbers over and over again. We, I'm telling you this tonight about how the, how what the numbers look like and how much cheaper it will be than using fossil fuel. And if the price of of, um, of crude oil goes up again, then we are in big trouble because the cost will move from 14 back to 20 cents. We have the possibility of generating just over 6 cents per kilowatt hour and we would not use that. What we do, we do with the gas, this is a blessing. Although it's not fully renewable, it's better, it's cleaner generating than using diesel or bunker C, which is what we're using. We're using bunker C now. And your administration is not taking renewable energy off the table? No. The forging forward. Amila Falls has to go forward. We have just wrote the IDB to using our 85 million US dollars that we had secured through the GRIF program, the sale of forest carbon to Norway. And we had parked in the IDB for the last 10, 12 years since I was president. We just decided we want to use them for big solar farms in Esquibo, Linden, and Burbies. So because those, are, you know, Linden, we subsidize power and Esquibo will not be part of the grid because the grid will run from Porica all the way to to Crabble Creek and then up to to Linden for the for the new renew, for the for the gas power project. So, so we are moving with solar. We've already written. We are moving by hopefully by the end of this year. We're starting to tender over 30 megawatts of renewable power from solar. We're we're restarting the hydro, the Amila discussion and the hydro, and we need the gas to energy project. Too. So, but the, the gas to energy project brings the numbers down significantly, gives us good base load power, and also is cleaner than the bunker C that we are using and the diesel. If that happens, we can cut the price of electricity by more than half to people, and that is what we are aiming to to cut the price. That will make a big difference in their lives, etc. People like Glen Lyle and the others can pay their electricity bill. He could pay his electricity bill every month. I've gone around the country, so for him we can go on another hundred years and we wouldn't, we don't have to worry, you know, because he pays his bill. It's not them. It's the people in the, in the areas I've gone to like Kanji or many parts of this country where I've gone to. And the people just can't afford to pay their electricity bill. Or every week the, the people who are generating jobs, industry, complaining that the electricity bill is driving down their profitability and making many projects that are good based on domestic raw material they can't do it because the cost of energy is prohibitive. We have to unlock all of those and we do it with cheap power. Now this whole thing about, oh, Anil Nandala said the studies are not done and I said the studies are done. 
we, we, we said we've made this, the decision to move forward with a project. It's technically feasible because anywhere in the world you can lay a pipeline and build a power plant. Secondly, if financially feasible, that is settled. What we now have, the studies we are embarked upon that is to be done will be the environmental study, the geotechnical and the geophysical study. Combine these three studies would allow us to design where the pipeline will go, which route it will take, how deep you have to put the pipeline, all of those things, and, and the power plant. It will lead to the design of that. That is what studies have to be completed. It's not, it's, they, they confuse financial feasibility with, with technical feasibility, with studies to be done to ensure that the project gets along. It's a nightmare every single day that you have to respond to things that you think would be so obvious to people. Do you think it would be part um, this administration's inability again to address Kaicho News for what it really is? Um, Kaicho News seemed to, over the years, have taken a controversial position. They would jump from one side to the other side to ensure the maintenance of controversy to sell papers. Unlike being a beacon of truth, that is really needed for Guyana. Do you think is is your now this new administration inability but, to accept I wish, for what they are? No, but 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 you know why? I wish that they were so vigilant with all of the things that happened under Afton. Now we are questioning why the why the choice of wheels. They're not saying that a study was done since 2016 and Patterson and the others never made a decision because had they made the decision then we probably have the pipeline already here and the power plant um, going up already but they then used the study and then some people started buying up lands in region 4 where the pipeline would terminate so now they're complaining that if they were so vigilant then they would have probably dealt with that issue to a great extent now we took the decision. They had several sites, Burbies um, in the Crab Island area. They had some sites in, the, in Region 4 going by just on the East Bank, by Providence area. They have the site over the river. So we said, let's examine all the sites. Policy-wise, we said, Region 4, this can only work if we put not just power plant, but there are several industries like Point Lisa in Trinidad or an industrial complex everywhere where you have a lot of industries that are a bit more polluting than normal, where you have effluents you have to get rid of, where you have chemical storage like, like what the people were upset with in Region 4 right here when the EPA was going to give permission. So let us go out, Region 4, the lands are extremely valuable too, for housing, for business development, for commercial activities. So let us use an area where we have state land that are not so valuable and that are more relatively isolated so you can ship the heavy industries out there. So the sites came up. Wales that they had just shut down, decimating the whole area, and and you and the Crab Island area. We compare the two sites. We have the financial numbers. It makes sense to go to Crab Island here. I'm not to Crab Island to Wales for several for several reasons. The numbers work out in favor. So. For them, going to Wales now is a big problem. Not that they, the power generated at Wales would stay at Wales and be funneled to PPP homes, but, but it will be transmitted to all across the country from Crabwood Creek to Parika all the way to Linden because you generate the power there. But they're worried about that now. 
because it's a PPP area. Wales, by the way, is one of the most diverse that, areas but they don't in know Guyana. That. They, they are West, they think, West they think Wales is pro PPP only Indo Guyanese live there. As though in PPP areas, no development must go there. I see a number of people there gather, some professor questioning why Wales. The one questioning when it was coming to Region 4, Region 4 is perceived to be a, a pro Guyanese and, and PNC. Although in Region 4, a lot of Indo Guyanese live here too. Anytime anything has to go to an area that's perceived, it's not real, because as you said, it's a diverse area. They're questioning why it has to go there, as though PPP people that don't have a right to development too. So, but in this case, the numbers worked out well, and we can put the entire estate into multiple use, commercial, a, a bit for housing. We did, did an entire map of the area, conceptual map, heavy industry, storage, all of that. It is something that can group facilities there. They have a problem with this site selection. And, and the thing, but they would never have a problem when upload. So, so why didn't they write about those issues? That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Not a word about those issues. Not a, a single word over the many years. I've seen maybe about three or four articles when the gas to energy project came up in the entire period the, when we were in opposition. We have decided what we're doing. We're laying out the conceptual basis, but do you think we will stop the development of the country because of this? And if some people think it's arrogance, it's not arrogance, it's because at the end of the day, we have a duty to ensure people have cheaper power, they can find jobs, they can take care of their families. We don't have time to waste every single day um, there are people who have no responsibility whatsoever except generate trouble. So that is the issue. I think that the period, Taichono played a good role, a great role in the period on the democracy side. But before that, they exhibited a serious set of cowardice in addressing uh, issues that were known to them to be corrupt. They had all the information in many of the ministries. Look at what happened in the drug sector. How could you think we're finding $10 billion worth of expired drug in the bonds? How it, there, there was no system, but it wasn't Bobby Ramu to us anymore. There was no Ramu. What did they write about air all of uh, that entire period. The public service grew by, by, by 10,000 people were added to public service. You didn't hear much about it. The, the, there was a total abuse of almost the entire government apparatus. And so, so this is why the procurement fraud, they practically had no major procurement and very little was written about it. So I don't have a problem with a newspaper doing what it should do, which is exposing the corruption, if there is anything incompetent of the government, demanding more factual information. But in this basis, they're not demanding factual information. When you supply it, 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 it never gets used. And they continue to repeat the, the lie or get another person somebody who doesn't even understand the issue to come and headline it. Oh, this person says it's a bad location. The person doesn't have a clue about even where whales, some of these people, who, they don't probably couldn't find whales on the map of Guyana and making comments like those. That is designed to frustrate a national agenda for personal interests. Dr. Jagger, I want to thank you. Uh, I think it's been very interesting. A lot has been said about a lot of issues affecting Guyanese. And I hope um, very soon again we will do this with the intention of covering other areas that yeah, we might sure. not have covered since there's so much 
Guyanese want to do. To the viewers, thank you for tuning in to Daybreak News, and I'm hoping this has been edifying for you.